Welcome to episode 67 of the Clarity Compressed Podcast. My name is Paul J. Daly, and today I come to you from sunny Napa Valley, where we are going to interview a Navy fighter pilot. Clarity can only really exist in the light of truth. Branding just isn't a tactic. It's a lifestyle change. Today, we have a guest that I think is going to bring a lot of value to a lot of people because... Yes, he is a leader in one of the top auto groups in the country, but more importantly, he is a leader. And uh, we're talking about somebody who has flown missions, uh, combat missions. He talks about that a little bit in this interview. His name is Kevin Fry, and he's just a really special person. I've been following him for the last few years just because of the automotive industry, and the more I learn about him, like I think most great people and most great leaders, you realize their background is a lot more diverse than just what they do at the moment because it takes a lot of friction, a lot of tension, a lot of trial, a lot of conflict for anybody to achieve big things, for anyone to achieve a level of leadership where they have the level of empathy and the level of authority and can provide the vision and motivation to other people to achieve things, well, they have to go through conflict. They have to go through tough times. And Kevin is one of those guys where if you follow him on Instagram, we have a couple funny stories to tell. We're going to try to show you some pictures. Um, He's a person that doesn't shy away from conflict, but he does it with compassion. He does it with care. He does it out of a personal mission to uplift others. And you're going to hear a little bit about in this interview. So uh, whatever you're doing, whether you're in automotive or in business, or you're just trying to improve personally, you want to be a better person, to be a better leader, this interview is going to help you take a step forward. Kevin, Kevin, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with me and the Clarity Compressed audience today, taking some time out. Okay, so I know a lot of our audience doesn't know who you are. Mm-hmm. I've been kind of following you for a, a few years at least as I've been you know, more engaged in the automotive industry. But you kind of are one of those people that I've considered like, you know, you could easily be one of the most interesting men in the world. <laughs> um, and so I want to unpack that a little bit. Sure. But uh, for, for start off, why don't you just uh, tell everybody uh, just like the 60 second, how you got here in life. Like, what's your background? Well, I got to tell you, like a lot of people in automotive, I fell into the industry. Me too. Uh, my earlier years, I flew for the Navy for eight years. Uh, I'm older, so I flew in Desert Shield and had over 200 combat hours in Desert Storm, did Southern Watch, got out 96, and started my own business. And during that time frame, I got involved with the early days of the Internet and eBay specifically, which led to eBay Motors, and back then there was no instruction book on how to sell a car online. Started figuring that out, fell into the automotive industry by default, and I've been with the uh, Jeff Wire Automotive family for, oh gosh, 14 years. And the simplest way I describe myself, Paul, is I try to be an agent of positive change in the industry. Tell me a bit, bit about the Weiler Group. Where do they, where do they stand in the national scene? Sure. There's about 18,000 franchise yep. dealers in the country. Uh, we rank, I think it's number 37, number 38. Mm-hmm. We have f- 15 rooftops, but the reason we're so big is that we have four auto malls. So we sold over 40,000 cars last year, uh, and we're in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana, but that's why we have such uh, m- volume and size. And what's your role with the company? I am the, the marketing director for the entire group. It's a busy job. It is, and it, <laughs> I, I wear many hats, like most people in automotive. I might have the title marketing director, but there's all, also 14 other jobs are probably in that description. Yeah, it's yeah. like how many things can we throw under that Absolutely. in your leadership. So um, so you flew in the Air Force. I mean, in the Navy. I'm sorry. I That's won't right. make that mistake again. It's very, <laughs> the Navy is the best. <laughs> um, so you flew in the Navy, flew combat missions. Uh, what did you fly? P-3s. It was a bigger plane. Yep. And the the biggest thing I brought away from uh, being in the service is just the leadership. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. It always comes down to people. Mm -hmm. And automotive is no different. Uh, With the significant change we've seen with the the Internet, and now we're seeing the advent of digital retailing and whatnot, it just takes strong leadership to carry people through that. Yeah, and I've I've really enjoyed uh, through the conference this weekend, learned a little bit about you guys are doing some really cool stuff with augmented reality, and really, I was watching the eyes of the other dealers in the room, and like... (laughs) Oh, that's possible. Like, so I've saw, I've seen pictures of you at Google's headquarters, right? So you really kind of not even think, it seems like you're not approaching the auto industry like the auto industry. Um, it's something I talk about a lot. 
you're approaching it as a retail facing business. Absolutely. What What is your perception on what customers or what the retail uh, public want in a in an auto transaction or an experience with a car dealer? Because I know a lot of our listeners might not be in the car business, but they certainly drive and buy. So, mm-hmm. what, I'm just curious in how you approach their their psyche and their mindset. <laughs> I have an engineering background, and from that I've learned in as much as I like technical things, I've got to keep things simple. And when I look at the businesses today that are most successful in a market that's incredibly demanding, and we all hear the same names, it's always Amazon, Zappos, Disney, Apple. Mm-hmm. The one thing they have in common is that they they excel at being consumer facing. Yep. So the challenge I've been putting out to the industry, and I, this is the one we follow, Every business decision we make, we just ask a simple question. Does this make us more consumer facing? Yep. If the answer is yes, we're already more than halfway there. I think the biggest push right now from consumers is their most valuable asset is time. Mm-hmm. They do not like going into a dealership and going through a three to four hour car buying experience. That's why we're really hot on digital retailing. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you that the biggest challenge we have right now is not so much the online digital retail experience, it's the actual delivery and execution in the showroom. Very, very clear. Uh, a few weeks ago, um, I had Ernie Garcia, CEO of Carvana, on the show. Oh, good. And, um, and you know, he talked a lot about just listening, right? Mm-hmm. It's something I talked about in the book that I just wrote. You know, I think what they've done well is they've listened to what the sentiment is. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think Carvana is doing right? And also, what do you think the advantages are of a local dealership that has a lot of brick and mortar? Sure. Uh, I'm following Carvana closely, and I'm a fan. And uh, a lot of dealers say, well, you can't do that. you got to be cynical oh, of no. Carvana. You should have seen the LinkedIn conversations but, uh, we had following that interview. Uh, I've learned so much watching them, and it's exciting because what they're doing, they have branded themselves as the the place to buy online Mm -hmm. and the reality is they have to follow the same rules we do as leaders so when they deliver that car they're going to show up with paperwork you're going to have to sign things right compliance doesn't change that's correct state by state regulation but if if someone that buys a car from carvana is asked by their friends how did you buy their car they're going to say i bought it online right so we want to follow that (laughs) example too and I believe that Carvana has really set the way. They're showing a new way to buy a car, a simpler way. One of the areas where I believe we have a significant advantage is on the acquisition of vehicles, Mm -hmm. uh, on trade versus Mm -hmm. I believe Carvana is acquiring primarily by auction, which is a more tricky format. And uh, and every study I've seen to date still shows that the majority of people want to physically test drive a car. I understand Carvana has the uh, the period where you can have the car, you can return it if you don't like it. But to me, that would be the other big advantage we have as dealers is their ability to come in and drive the vehicles. And do that. You know, one of the conversations that sprung up was around the mattress industry. And, you know, a lot of mattress in the box industries mm-hmm. are crushing the traditional model. Mattress and automotive are very, very similar in their pedigree and nature. We'd sell products, we'd mark them up, we'd discount them, we'd make money on warranties and things like very simple financing very similar and mattress in the box has totally disrupted the mattress industry Mm -hmm. right and you think of these companies like purple and casper tuft and needle right they're saying hey we'll just ship you sleep on it for however many days if you don't Mm -hmm. like it send it back right similar to what carvana's promising right drive if you don't like it send it back but there is an inherent disadvantage in the service element of if you don't like it like there's a lot of friction to send Mm -hmm. the car back you no longer have your own car Right now, you have to pick another one, go through the whole process again, and mm-hmm. wait. And with the mattress company, I always joke, you know, they come out of the box like vacuum sealed. Mm-hmm. So it comes in this little box. They don't really show you like, well, how do you get it back in the box? Like, how do you ship it? <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> and so, so I think that you know the local dealers do have an advantage on the service side. Like, there's mm-hmm. touch points. You know, now Carvana has other advantages. Local mm-hmm. dealers have, and it's really interesting to see those make each other better. Mm-hmm. I mean, the numbers just came out, and and Carvana needs to do another raise sooner than they thought, yes. right? And I think it breaks down. They sold uh, 34, 37,000 37, cars. 37,000. And they right. lost about 2,100 a copy, mm-hmm. right? So, like, they're still trying to figure out that model. So I think it's still a really open race. But like you said, they've they've shown a way, and they've well, unlocked a sentiment. Their rapid growth speaks volumes. I believe they doubled up on revenues. Yep. In, uh, and I know they're still losing money. Uh, but I also know that they're starting to adjust their model. Yep. Uh, they are 
really pricing more to market and pricing for convenience, which yep. I'm convinced is a big aspect to this. If you're going to provide a frictionless experience, mm -hmm. it, to me, it's no different than going to the corner store late at night to get a gallon of milk. You're willing to pay for convenience. Right. And anybody involved with digital retailing needs to do the same. I, one of the questions I've got for a couple years now is, is Carvana going to make it? Mm -hmm. My answer has always been simple. I'm not sure if they're going to make it, but I can guarantee this. If they don't, they have paved the way. The next five people, one of those will make it. for someone Absolutely. to follow them. Absolutely. Um, thank you for your insight on that. I think it's, it's, it's a conversation that's relevant to most people. Absolutely. You know, because people buy cars, drive cars, that's need right. cars to live. Um, let me pivot back to something you said. I want to want to talk a little bit about um, your leadership experience, like what the pedigree was, you know, mm -hmm. through the Navy, and obviously you've been with Wyler for a long time. You're um, you're seen as an industry leader. You have, if you check out your Instagram feed and all that, you realize that you have a really full, rich life. You have a, a very strong family life. I saw a slide the other day where. You have this property where you restored a cabin and you ended up spelunking into a well. Tell, tell me that story first, actually, because I think we're going to find that picture. Or I'm going to get it from you. Oh, that's funny. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we bought 34 <laughs> acres four years ago. Boy, did we get into a project. <laughs> and it had a dilapidated old house on the entrance, which we started stripped and underneath was a log cabin. And it was an original log cabin built from the 1820s. No way. And we decided to restore it, which has been a big adventure, <laughs> very similar if you've watched like Barnwood Builders. There is a well, the original hand dug well from the 1820s is there, and there was a pump in the bottom providing water, which was broke. I couldn't pay anyone in their right mind to go into the bottom of this so, well. So tell me, people showed up. And like, you, did you call people and they came out and I took did. a look at it? I called several plumbers <laughs> and they, and the other thing too is it's pretty small. We'll, we'll, we'll get the picture so yeah. we can show it. And if you're just listening, you're not watching it. I mean, we're talking like, what was the opening? It's three your worst three? claustrophobic nightmare. I literally was pumping out the well to get the water level down. I would go down as the water was rising. I was erasing its time to fix it. And then I'd have to come out, repump the well. I have another great picture when I come out holding a snake one day, oh my which gosh. my wife was none too thrilled. So she didn't hang around much at the entrance <laughs> to the well after that. So. so the kind of guy that gets into something like that <laughs> is obviously the kind of guy that doesn't shy away. And the, the fighter pilot mentality, like you, you don't shy away from conflict. And, and what's your view on, on what conflict does to a person like throughout life? Uh, it's a measure of how you respond to it, and uh, you know, in the military background, you're going to obviously see a lot of conflict, a lot of pressure, and the mm -hmm. way they approach it uh, really is just a lot of training process, training process that you're always aware of what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And and I got to tell you candidly, even the first day of Desert Storm, going into obviously a very dangerous situation, I was calm. I was I just felt collected, calm, collected, and confident in my aircraft and in the training and in the process that we followed to work through that. And when we hit big change in automotive, it's the same thing. If you can define a clear process for them and train on that mm -hmm. and lead through that, that's where we find success. I'll, I'll tell you, Paul, my biggest battle in automotive, sincerely, has always been within our dealerships. The I mean, the, the challenge is I have to sell them on the new ideas and the new concepts and get them to believe in it. But once we get them there and you lead them through that change, that's where we're finding success with the consumers. So I think that's any organization. Absolutely. You know, um, what do you see the, the primary job of any leader to be? So you, you lead a big team, mm -hmm. right? And you've led in the past. Um, it's kind of your mentality. What do you see a leader's primary job job one for a leader step number one is you got to give clarity of the vision I mean you have to let them know clearly this is what we're looking to to do how we're going to achieve it and then you got to lead them through that process it's that simple if, if it's a mystery if it's in the air mm -hmm. you're never going to get anywhere and I've had many friends that'll that'll go into a large dealership group or even outside of automotive and they think, well, gee, if I bring in these three pieces of technology and I bring this solution over tactics. here, everything's going to right. work. Right, tactics. None of it works without the people behind it. If you can get the people on board, I'm telling you, you can have some of the worst tools in place, mm -hmm. but you'll find success if you've got the people on board and believing with you. Interesting. You know, uh, speaking in, in terms of military conflict, this is why 
you know, I've had, I've had friends in special forces, things like that. And what happens when, when an opposing force, even with very primitive weaponry, with the vision, mm -hmm. right, understanding what they're fighting for and the motivation to do it, it's amazing what that can achieve. That's a great analogy, and it's true. Yeah, and it's a, big, it's a big pain, but you see a, a superior force with superior technology and every tactical advantage imaginable, mm -hmm. and you still have a hard time breaking through. And the other a great part of that analogy is that it's timeless. We have seen that not yes. just for hundreds of years, we've seen it for thousands, Recorded thousands of history. years. Recorded history. Absolutely. The vision and the motivation goes a long way, so mm -hmm. if the leader that can provide that, that Correct. boils right down to organizations, not-for-profits, automotive, retail, mm -hmm. family life, right? As a leader of your yeah. family, same thing. You know, I would share one of the, the greatest leaders we had at Jeff Weiler Automotive, and unfortunately he has passed, but he did the simplest thing twice a day. And it was at our biggest auto mall, so this is a big complex. He would get out from behind his desk and he would walk from one end of the strip to the other and basically talk to almost every single person and every conversation always ended the same. Is there anything I can do to help you today? He knew his people inside and out. Mm -hmm. And as a result, when there were tough times and hard days to work, mm -hmm. we would rise to the occasion. And, uh, and when there were times of praise, obviously we embellished that, but he, because we knew his presence and his leadership style and he was out with the people, he hated to be behind the desk. Mm -hmm. He truly is one of the best leaders. He's probably the best leader we've had in that organization, just as a reflection of that. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Just in touch. Absolutely. In fact, I just had a, we had a new younger uh, person that promoted into a GM position, and he feels overwhelmed. I completely understand. And that was the first piece of advice I gave him. I said, go back to the service department. You don't know him because you haven't been back there. And the more you go back each day and connect, you're going to build your team and be able to move forward from there. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. A um, couple quick questions to close it out. What personally drives you? You're obviously someone who's very ambitious, you mm -hmm. know, in the workplace, with your family, fixing wells. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, you seem to be in good shape. I saw your Instagram, you run. Mm -hmm. um, what drives you? Uh, at the end of the day, I believe God has planted me here in life uh, to serve others and to uplift others, and that's my goal. And when I say agent of positive change mm -hmm. uh, that is what drives me each day and to me that is a a serving quality that for me is is, is a spiritual thing with god that i want to do so i want to go out and be selfless mm -hmm. not selfish mm -hmm. i want to serve others and uh, i think everybody could always use some unconditional love and uplifting so and encouragement so true yeah last thing uh, you get to ask a question to the audience that uh, might provoke them to think about things in a new way or make positive change in their life. What mm -hmm. question would you ask to just get the juices flowing? That's a great I will put a challenging question. Okay. When you go to work, do you bring your faith with you or do you leave it at the door? And there are a lot of jobs today where a lot of people feel like they have to leave it at the door and that they have to compromise. Automotive is one of those areas that's very challenging. And uh, in one of my goals is to try and encourage and uplift people to say, hey, you can bring your faith, you can bring your values to work and, uh, and make the world a better place, right? I agree with that. And I think that when they do that, right, and the, the intention is, like you said, to serve other people, mm -hmm. uplift them, I don't think anyone's going to mind. I don't mind either. And you know, one of the simplest <laughs> things I learned young is someone told me, he says, hey, if you want to be successful, just help the others around you succeed. And uh, there's been no truer statement. It's true. So that, that ties right back in with uplifting and helping others. Great. Well, thank you so much for giving us a little bit of time. Um, unknowingly, you've been somebody I've been watching and an inspiration to me in oh, thanks, this industry to, to be better. So thank you. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. So what do you think? Did I oversell you or was it the way that it actually was? Kevin Fry is a very special man. It was awesome to have a few minutes to talk with him today. And in the end, I think... His, the question of the day, the question that I asked him, and his answer to it, you know, what would you, would you ask people to do? And he said, you know, bring your faith with you to work every day or to whatever you do. Those beliefs to encourage and improve and motivate it and primarily to serve other people. When you do that, when you do that and you mean it, you're not giving to get, but you're giving to give, 
I don't think you will ever be disappointed at what the result is. Sure, sometimes when you give of yourself and sometimes when you, you know, try to serve others, sometimes they kick it back in your face, sometimes that it doesn't reciprocate and that can be hurtful, that can be painful, but the net net game is a win. So I'm just going to tag off his encouragement to you today. Go serve some other people today, and I promise you, you will never be disappointed with the long-term results. So thanks for tuning in, listening, watching. Thanks for letting me be a part of your morning commute or walking the dog or just a little time when you have to relax and get a little motivation, whatever it is. Thank you so much for spending time with me, Kevin, this audience. Keep touching base. Keep reaching out. I'm loving the DMs and the messages. Uh, would love to help in any way I can. Until then... Pursue clarity.